Are you thinking of going back to nursing school and, and trying to decide between obtaining an MSN degree or a DMP degree? If that's the case, this video is for you. I'm going to talk about how to choose, the things to know, including the type, specialty, salary, regulation, all of those things that you need to know considering going for your graduate degree in nursing. Hi, this is Tracy, your academic nurse. Welcome back to my channel. I can't wait to get into today's topic. But before I do, if you have any questions or want to screenshot yourself watching this video and want to shout out in a future one, go ahead and hit me up on my social right here or right here, wherever it shows up on the screen and screenshot yourself watching this video, post it to my Instagram, and I'll be happy to give you a shout out. So first, let's start with the basics. What's the difference between an APN and an APRN? Well, an APN is an advanced practice nurse and an APRN is an advanced practice registered nurse. Seems pretty obvious, right? Well, there really is a difference in between the two. An APN is a nurse with a graduate degree and an APRN is a very defined type of nurse with a graduate degree. The main difference is that APNs typically are non-clinical. Those are those types of nurses that are exec admin, or nursing informatics, public health, those types of nursing degrees that are non-clinical typically. APRNs, on the other hand, were defined by the consensus model, which came out in 2008. And the consensus model was from the work from the APRN regulation, from the Advanced Practice Nursing Consensus Work Group, and the NCSBN APRN Committee. Now, that's a lot of alphabet soup. What does that mean? NCSBN stands for the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and they put together a work group in conjunction with the other work group to try to come up with some consensus and standards across several areas when it came to APRNs. So let's talk about that. What did they come up with in 2008? Well, in 2008, they defined those nurses as those that were either nurse practitioners, certified nurse midwives, CNSs, clinical nurse specialists, or CRNAs, which we now call nurse anesthesiologists. NPs were regulated then by titles, specialties, and foci. Up until that point, that really hadn't happened. So back in those days, it was kind of like the wild, wild west. They defined the titles that were to be used, the specialties, the certifications, and they resulted in something called the LACE model. Now, LACE stands for licensure, accreditation, certification and education. So what this panel sought to do was really bring consensus among the educational models and make sure that there was some standardization across the states and across programs educationally in licensure and certification and in all of those sequelae that came from that including titles, specialization, special uh, titles, specialty. What is a specialization? That's weird. I don't even know what that means. I just made up a new word. Titles, specialty foci, population, there it is, population. All of those things then became part of the LACE model, which was under the consensus model. Occasionally, you may still see some of those original titles still grandfathered into practice, but the population now defines the types of titles that are certification-based and are typically licensed in nursing. So now that we know what an APRN is, should we choose MSN or DNP? Well, that's the question today. So let's talk about that. First, what's the big push? Why is there all the chatter between MSN or DMP? That wasn't the case a couple of years ago, and now we're really hearing it a lot. Well, let me give you a little background on that. Back in 2002, NOF said that as a profession, nursing should start moving to the DMP as entry for nurse practitioners. So what is NOF? That's the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculties, and they are very instrumental in a lot of things that happen in nurse practitioner education. Not to be left out, the AACN jumped on that bandwagon just a couple of years later in 2004 and said, yes, yes, we think so too. We think the DMP should be the entry point for nurse practitioners. Over the years, NOMP continued to beat this drum, putting out statement and really trying to get the narrative out there that DMP should be the entry to practice. Finally, in 2018, they put out a position statement and said, basically, we're transitioning that direction. Get on board. Of the four APRN types, the CRNA which is also co-governed by COA, so the nurse anesthetists or nurse anesthesiologists, which
which are also governed by the COA, the Council on Accreditation. They've jumped in. They're all about it. So they have moved to DMP as practice entry. And those programs that are left that are still MSN are closing or in the process of being closed. So the nurse anesthesiologists have jumped on board. The other ones, not so much. We still have a couple of different options for the other types of APRNs. So what happened? Why didn't they all move that direction? Well, some did. Some programs actually closed their MSN. Some started phasing them out in favor of a BSN to DNP model. Others created sort of a hybrid entry path, having both an MSN and a post MSN to DNP. Having said that, what happened is a lot of them realized, wait a minute, this really isn't good for our bottom line. Also, it's not good for market demand. So we might wanna rethink that position. Just two years ago, there were 24 MSN programs that were in process of being approved. That means that they're not dying out necessarily. Several issues, two in particular, have exacerbated this move to a DNP as entry to practice. I bet you can imagine what they are. So number one, market demand. Definitely market demand, which goes in hand in hand with the nursing shortage. Pandemic anyone? Nursing shortage. With a nursing shortage and the demand in the market for nursing and nurse practitioners and rural areas more and more being forced out of the healthcare arena having no healthcare whatsoever, it has become paramount that NPs be able to get into practice and to be able to fill those gaps. Another reason that the DMP hasn't really taken off as entry to practice is that the certifying bodies aren't requiring it for certification. So if the AANC and AACN and P CMB and some of those other certifying bodies are not requiring it for entry to practice, then people really aren't going to rush to do it. As I already mentioned, some of the universities that initially closed their program or started closing their programs just saw those students shift to other programs. So while there are MSM programs available, it doesn't make sense for some universities to close their programs, especially those that are autonomous universities or freestanding programs. Those programs really don't have maybe the other programs to help kind of offset a loss like that. What does that mean? Well, that means means that as long as programs have the MSN, other programs are going to continue to keep them to keep their share of the market demand. Another perceived block to the DMP being entry to practice is perceived value of the DMP in the clinical setting. We'll get into that in a little bit more in a bit, but I just wanted to throw that out there so you know that we'll be talking about that too. Also, this kind of goes into the nursing shortage again, but the longer it takes to get into practice and the more debt that a nurse has to build to get a graduate degree is a detractor for from going to a longer program. It just makes sense. Those are some of the blocks that we're seeing to DMP to entry. So bottom line, unless some of those issues are resolved, I think the MSN, it might be here to stay for a little while. So then why would anyone get a DMP? Why would you get a DMP then? Well, most people get them because of several reasons. One is a personal goal. Do you have a personal goal to have a terminal degree? Do you have a personal goal to perhaps teach one day or to go into to a different area, maybe administration, even with your clinical degree, even if you have a nurse practitioner degree or, or MSN degree with a nurse practitioner certification, if you ever wanted to climb that ladder in that organization, many organizations like to have those in those areas of management or administration with a terminal degree. In fact, it's really important too for magnet status for many hospitals. So those are some of the reasons that people are continuing to get DNP degrees. So let's talk about everyone else. What about those who just wanna stay in clinical practice? What are the advantages to obtaining the DMP degree? So I have to admit, since I do hold a DMP degree, I can't help but be a little bit biased in this area. I can say with some authority that the DMP is a degree and not a role. Being a nurse practitioner is a role. The MSN or the DMP is the degree. There's a whole other video that I would have to do to really d explain the difference between a role in a degree. A degree does not make a role. Many people hold very, very strong opinions about the DMP or the value of having a DMP in the clinical setting. For me, the value of having a DMP in the clinical setting came in the form of being able to see a bigger picture. Now, this is my personal experience, but I can tell you when I would start to see trends or start seeing things 
happening in my unit or in my floor, in my area, I would start to think about, okay, what's the root cause analysis? What are the larger things happening here? What does the literature say? And those are things when I was practicing against an MSN, I did consider, but not to the same extent. So I can tell you for me personally, it broadened my horizons, it broadened my knowledge, and it broadened the way that I thought about clinical practice. That's not to say that someone with an MSN can't do the same because they can. However, I don't think any education like this is ever really wasted. Often the DMP is unfairly compared to a medical residency. That's like the old saying, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, then the fish will think it's an utter failure. Well, it's two totally different things. One does not correlate or correspond to the other at all. They're two totally different animals. And really the comparison is unfair. Nevertheless, having a DMP in the clinical setting remains a hot topic. I get it. So let's move over to another area that people talk about when it comes to the DMP, and that is the salary. Is there a salary difference? Is it worth it? Well, let's talk about that. So according to the Medscape APRN compensation report in 2021, which was just released in December of 2021, 3,309 APRNs were surveyed. The majority were nurse practitioners, 2,016 of those in fact, followed by 505 CNSs, 380 CRNs, RNAs, 408 nurse midwives, and all of that was based on 2020 data. So in 2021, they performed a survey of those in 2020 and released it toward the end of 2021 when they had time to compile the data. And here's what they found related to DNPs in clinical practice. They said among nurse practitioners, those with a doctorate make about 5% more than those with a master's. The average is 115,000 to 121,000. That's the comparison. Comparison. However, the doctorate was undifferentiated. They didn't say what kind of doctorate, they just did a doctorate degree. And then later they actually said PhD or DNS. So DMP wasn't really mentioned at all, which I find strange. However, looking for other data sources on salaries for both groups, both the MSN and the DMP, I further found that Nurse Practitioner Online reports that there is an average of about a $7,000 difference, which works out to be about 6% between a MSN prepared nurse practitioner and a DMP prepared nurse practitioner. And they actually used the terminology DMP. However, that's based on 2018 data. And Nurse Practitioner Online actually got their data from bls.gov, which reports current salaries. Now, Medscape did mention something that was very promising, and that's year over year based on their comparisons, because they do these surveys yearly, that salaries for nurse practitioners are actually on the rise. So that is encouraging news. Okay, so now that we know what the salaries are, we know what the differences are, we know what the different types are, what's on the horizon? What are the new regulations? Well, there are new things on the horizon, that's for sure. So the AACN last year updated their essentials. There used to be essentials that, that the framework for the educational competencies were outlined for the baccalaureate, the masters, and the DNP, all three separately. Now, we have changed the way that that structure works, and they are are more of a leveling competency with, with no discernible difference between the MSN and the DNP. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because those new essentials are being embedded into curricula as we speak. If there's really no discernible difference between the MSN and the DNP, why not just go with the DNP to entry to practice? Some would argue that that was the entire point of the update. I'm not convinced of that. I think that the update was needed and that competency-based education is the wave of the future. However, it does make a compelling argument to move toward the DMP for entry. Similarly, the NTF criteria, which is what the framework or the guidelines that the nurse practitioner programs are built on, were last updated in 2016. There is a group working on updating those now, and one of the major, one of the major recommendations coming out of that group right now is to double the clinical hours that the programs are required to have. Now, I'm not going to get into whether or not I think this is a good idea. There are a lot of people pro and a lot of people con. What I can say is that a doubling of clinical hours will necessarily lead to more time in the program. In fact, probably upwards of a year longer in a program. Well, if you're going to spend an extra year in a program, why not just get a DNP? And again, there are those that would argue that this is another way to 
really back door, but to push everyone along in the same direction for DMP to entry. Now again, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Not in this climate, not post pandemic, not when a large portion of the nursing workforce is looking for jobs elsewhere or changing to travel or doing other things. Not when we have the type of healthcare disparities that we have in the rural settings. I just don't see this happening anytime soon. I'm not convinced that by 2025, that MSN will go away and DMP will definitely be entry to practice. I'm just not convinced that we're there yet as a profession and as a society. So where does this leave us? Well, where this leaves us is, is the decision is really yours. It always was. Do you want a DMP? What are your reasons for having a DMP? Do some self-examination, understand what your goals are, and have realistic expectations about how long you would be in school, what it would take, and really what is it going to do for your career depending on your path. Thank you so much for listening to me today. This is Tracy. I'm your academic nurse. I have totally enjoyed our time today. This is a topic that I absolutely love. If you have have any comments, please drop those for me down here in the comments section. If you want to check out any more of my work, go on over to theacademicnurse.com. That's theacademicnurse.com. There you can check up on my blog and all the new posts, including recent videos. Also, don't forget, I need those likes. Who doesn't like positive affirmation, right? Likes help me to know that I'm on the right track with creating content for you. Also, consider subscribing to my channel. That really helps me make sure that I can continue to make the type of content that you want to have. Thanks so much again for dropping by and until next time, it's your academic nurse saying bye.